Imagine the softest thing you ever touched. Imagine the richest thing you've ever eaten. Remember the last time you felt something or picked something up and thought, Whoa, that's nice. The expensive kind of nice. There are so many rich, decadent experiences one can have in life, but few have the endurance of owning and driving one of these cars. This is a 2006 Lexus LS430. This was at one time the flagship model of the Lexus brand and the top of the Toyota line in the United States. And this, the 2001 to 2006 model, is argued by many to be the pinnacle of all Lexus LS generations and thus the peak of American Toyota motoring, period. After all, the LS430 came about in a time when Toyota was at their best and in fact, car building on the whole was at a high point. To say that this was one of the best cars on sale in its day would be to sell it short. Ladies and gentlemen, the Lexus LS430 is one of the greatest automobiles of all time. This particular example is a gem even among LS430s. It's a well-kept, 140,000-mile, final model year, post-facelift car with a relatively desirable selection of options. And due simply to its current point in the depreciation curve and the declining favorability of large sedans, this car was recently purchased from the original owner for less than $10,000, making a used LS430 more car for your money than anything else I can think of. Now, a casual observer unfamiliar with the upper-range, purpose-built Lexuses might be tempted to frame this car in their mind as little more than a rear-wheel-drive Toyota Avalon. A nice car, sure, but simply another big, soft, boring sedan. This one perhaps a touch more robust and expensive than most. To dismiss the LS430 in this way is a grave mistake. To assume that a driving experience cannot simultaneously be unexciting and stunning is a grave mistake. Now, as you may know, the Lexus LS line began with the 1990 LS 400, which was a V8 rear-wheel drive executive luxury sedan purpose-built from scratch, fully unrelated to any pedestrian Toyota model and designed not to match but to blow the doors off the best from the likes of Mercedes-Benz, BMW, and Jaguar which it did quite successfully, putting Lexus on the map and completely upending the luxury car market. 11 years later, in 2001, the LS430 represented not a philosophical revolution over, but rather a thorough and complete evolution past that LS400. The result? Every single motion this car makes, every single interaction it has with its driver and passengers, is so painstakingly refined and unbelievably smooth and satisfying that many have been left in shock and awe at the experience. Think that's an exaggeration? How do you think an auditorium full of Ford employees felt when, in 2006, their CEO, Alan Mulally, stood before them and announced that he, himself, drove a Lexus LS430, stating plainly, and I quote, it's the finest car in the world. Look, the man wasn't talking about a multi-million dollar supercar. He was talking about a sub-six-figure, normal production flagship luxury sedan. A car that Ford itself should have ostensibly been able to compete with via its own Lincoln brand, or for that matter, Jaguar, which it did own at the time. By the way, the photograph that you see here, courtesy of ABC News, shows then Ford CEO Mulally stepping out of a Ford Motor Company private jet into said Lexus. Okay, now lots of top-of-the-line cars have come and gone over the decades. What makes this one so special? Well, other cars might be fine, but no other is so steadfast. The longer the hours, days, and years wear on with the LS430, the better you understand the depth of its refinement. Its design and its function are so thoroughly pleasing that the only explanation is the unusually massive amount of money and man-hours that Toyota poured into this car's development. As one Toyota official remarked around the time that the LS430 was released, the ratio of cost to design and develop Lexus models relative to the overall cost to produce the cars was notably higher than for other car brands, and it shows. 
All of the rough edges and shortcomings that seem to plague all cars to one degree or another are notably absent here. Lexus's tagline was the relentless pursuit of perfection, and experiencing the LS430 is evidence that this was more than just a nice sentiment. It truly was Lexus's mission. But the refinement with which it performs is only one side of the coin. The LS430's stellar reliability combines with its general merit to distinguish it as an unbeatable long-term partner. Day after day and year after year, the LS430 shows a freakish immunity to aging, and this is displayed both through infrequent outright failures, as well as a general lack of showing wear on the part of components that typically degrade evenly and slowly, body and interior pieces for instance. Indeed, the LS430 seeks not to reach out and grab your attention, rather, this is a car whose excellence is illuminated over time and experience, but a lot of people write it off. From the outside, the LS430 appears nice and well-finished, sure, but it's far from eye-catching and its overall shape and proportions are rather stuffy. This car's predecessor and successor both have more of a long, low, wide shape and so are, in my opinion, sleeker-looking sedans. The LS430, however, is very tall, with a relatively formal roofline. This is in direct contrast to the four-door coupe styling, which, while impractical, has become the style among the most expensive cars of recent times. But there's a reason why the LS430 looks so tall, you see. When this car's predecessor, the LS400, was being developed, Toyota determined what it believed to be the perfect footprint for an executive luxury sedan. It was decided that the ideal width and length for such a car were exactly 1.85 meters across and 5.0 meters long. These dimensions gave the LS400, especially the first generation LS400, backseat space that was more adequate than excessive. And Toyota was comfortable with this because the original LS400 was designed expressly for the North American flagship sedan market, a market where most buyers are getting a car to drive themselves rather than to be chauffeured in. But once the LS400 was developed, Toyota went ahead and offered it for sale in its native market of Japan as well, under the name Toyota Celsior, where the car caught on quite well and was a greater success than originally anticipated. Uh, since cars of this class are much more likely to be chauffeur-driven in Japan than they are in America, it was desired to grace the LS430 with a significantly larger back seat than the earlier cars had, in order to satisfy such customers. But with the car's length and width cast in stone, the LS430's designers had nowhere to go but up. Which is exactly what they did, and so this is a bit of a tall car. Another measure to increase passenger volume without changing footprint was the extension of the car's wheelbase by 3 inches over the outgoing LS400. Two of these inches appeared as newfound rear seat legroom and one inch accounted for the firewall creeping forward. So, the LS430 has a somewhat higher cowl line, and it has relatively little front and rear overhang. The relatively short hood and trunk give the car a bit of a pug nose and stubby tail, which combine with the big boxy passenger compartment to yield an overall shape that is thick and blocky. Many see a resemblance in this car to the 1990s W140 Mercedes-Benz S-Class, and this is particularly true from about the C-pillar back. Just take a look at that rear end treatment. While the LS400 wore a thinner, straighter C-pillar and a wraparound rear windshield, the 430's rear glass is much more two-dimensional with its C-pillar getting wider toward its base to make up the difference. The front end treatment is rather tall and upswept, with a thick strip of body color sheet metal separating the blocky trapezoidal headlights from the rather plain grille. Added along with the revised front and rear styling for 2004 were HID projector headlights and LED taillights. Sheet metal across the LS430's body is largely flat and featureless, with few creases or ridges contributing to a mild, conservative look. The side window sill sits below the hood and trunk lid and is dead flat. The windows are large and conventionally shaped. This particular car wears a pearl white paint scheme with the gold emblem package. The paint is of fine quality and is held up very well. White is probably, in my opinion, the best color for the LS430, with silver coming in second. I'm not a gold package guy myself, but I will admit that a white LS430 pulls it off better than most. The window tint looks good on this car too. Chrome trim is ample but not excessive. 
Wheel choices for the LS430 included 16 and 17 inch alloys in the earlier years, followed by 17 and 18 inch options on later cars like this one. The wheel design on this particular car, which came in both 17 and 18 inch sizes and both chrome and matte finishes, is my favorite of the alloy styles offered on the LS430. It's really the only one that I actually like. Most of the other wheel designs that came on these cars strike me as exceedingly dull or even a little dorky. But I do feel that these big fat five spokes do the car justice without being ostentatious. After experiencing this car, you might find it a little puzzling that Toyota would fit it with wheels that would look at home on a Chevy Malibu or a minivan. But it's a very Japanese reflection of who Toyota was as a company when they built this car. The objective was to perfect all of the fundamentals, to perfect all of the behind the scenes technical stuff, rather than to shout over everyone else in the room. What pictures can't do justice is the LS430's assembly quality. Like the LS400 before it, the LS430 was on the cutting edge of the world when it came to metrics like panel gap width and coefficient of drag. The quality of materials used on this car and the attention to detail are peerless. Again, pictures do not do the richness of the LS430's exterior build quality justice. If you want to know what I'm talking about, wash an LS430 by hand. Touching and scrubbing all of the body panels and trim and weather stripping will give you a new level of appreciation for the integrity and quality of this car's body. And this was achieved using the finest and latest engineering methods available at the time. For instance, Lexus claimed that state-of-the-art supercomputers were used to digitally render the entire exterior of the LS430 down to working tolerances of one thousandth of a millimeter. The engineer types will recognize that what Lexus was implying here was the use of numerical tools such as finite element analysis and computer-aided design. And while the use of numerical tools has proliferated and is now commonplace in virtually every aspect of automotive engineering, in the 80s and 90s, as computing power was increasing exponentially and with it, the potency of numerical methods, Toyota and Lexus were at the forefront of exploiting these tools in their rise to world domination. It was Toyota's willingness to pioneer such cutting-edge engineering methods that really set cars like the LS400 and LS430 apart, making their German competitors, which relied heavily on weaker and more conventional engineering methods, feel like relics from a bygone era. Helping to finish the LS430's body construction was extensive testing in the same highly advanced wind tunnel used in the development of Japan's famous bullet train. This yielded an extraordinarily low coefficient of drag of 0.26 in standard LS430s and 0.25 in the ultra-luxury models with air suspension, due to the fact that the car automatically lowered itself slightly at highway speeds. This testing led Lexus to develop highly advanced seals and moldings for every seam of the LS430's body, as depicted in this graphic from Lexus. Additionally, the underside of the LS430 is covered in plastic belly pans for better aerodynamics. While this has become significantly more commonplace today, in the LS430's time, this was rather advanced. Now, some cars have a low coefficient of drag to make them faster. For other cars, it's a matter of fuel economy. For this car... Those are simply collateral benefits. The LS430 was made extra slippery so that it would be extra quiet inside. And quiet it is. I thought that my LS400 was a quiet car, and it is, but this car is leaps and bounds quieter even than the old 400. In fact, this was the first car with a cabin quiet enough for high-end home audio maker Mark Levinson ever to deem an acceptable acoustic environment to design a stereo for. Yes, the cabin of the LS430 is quite a fine place indeed, as the same level of material quality and attention to detail from the exterior are present here too. Everything in here, the leather, the wood, the plastics, the fabrics, is truly rich stuff. When fans argue that the 430 was the pinnacle of all LS generations, the tactile satisfaction of simply being in here is a big part of what they're talking about. In 2019, it's not hard at all to find a car interior with more TV screens or gee whiz gadgets than this one, but it's getting tougher and tougher to find an interior with truly fine materials and robust build quality. It seems that in the years since the LS430 was on sale, things like fuel economy standards, fireproofing standards, and general cost cutting have led us to a point where we simply don't have cabins like this anymore, short of Rolls Royce or Bentley. Even the best luxury car interiors of today show shades of austerity when held up against the old LS430.
For the LS, Lexus studied makers of things like high-end guitars and watches in order to hone their wood and leather finishing techniques, culminating in a three-week process of hand sanding and hand staining for each car. Lexus made a point that all of the wood trim in any particular LS430 came from the same tree, so that the grains would match. They made a point to use as many cow's hides as necessary to get the right fit for each LS's seats. You'll notice, by the way, that this particular car comes with an aftermarket imitation wood trim kit, which, although not overly offensive, does distract somewhat from the factory wood trim in here, which is real and it's spectacular. This tan interior with bird's eye maple trim is my favorite of the several interior color schemes offered. It's both warm and tasteful. By the way, bird's eye maple is not some silly Lexus marketing term. It's actually a naturally occurring grain variation present in only a very small percentage of maple trees. Lexus thought it would be a nice touch here, and it is. It's quite handsome. Now, driving position and ergonomics are always a sticking point for me, and they're also a telltale sign of just how much thought and effort was put into any car's design. After spending hours behind the wheel under varying driving conditions in most any car, you can usually find a few things left to be desired. A lack of adjustability, a lack of space, a lack of support, a poorly placed control that causes you to have to reach. But the LS430 isn't just painstakingly well-developed, it's also a clearly user-centric car, and that really stands out from behind the wheel. The seats are as supportive and well-sculpted as any. They are power-adjustable in more ways than you can imagine. 14 ways for the driver to be exact, including two separate lumbar controls and extending thigh support, for instance. Overall seat comfort is fantastic. The steering wheel is, of course, tilt and telescoping. The electrofluorescent gauge cluster is a treat for the eyes. Armrests, both left and right, are perfectly placed. The accelerator pedal is a large, lower-hinged unit, and to the left is a proper dead pedal. Everything that the driver contacts is of the utmost quality. The leather of the seats, the center console, the door panels, the steering wheel, the gear shift. Everything you touch in this car just oozes quality. The variety of materials, the richness of them, their appearance, their buttery feel, the way everything is fastened together. Even in the lowest of LS430s, all of the leather trim in here is real, not vinyl, from the door panels to the center armrest. This is in contrast to even most luxury cars, including lesser Lexuses and even most copies of this car's successor, the LS460. Everything that moves, the storage compartments, the grab handles, the cup holders, is perfectly weighted and dampened. The controls of this car could not be more optimally placed and laid out, whether we're talking about the blinker stock, the gear shift, or the volume knob. If I do have one minor, subjective complaint about the feng shui of the driving position, it's that the cowl and dashboard come up a little higher than my personal ideal. But this was an honest compromise on the part of Lexus in order to maximize interior space given the exterior dimensions, not due to a design oversight or missed efficiency. More evidence of Lexus's emphasis on customer satisfaction is how easy and straightforward the LS430 and all its features are to use, especially considering the time when this car came out. Its German competitors were entering the digital age by piling on electronic gadgets and accessories that looked and sounded like something out of an action movie but were ultimately convoluted and distracting to use, marring the driving experience. The LS430's control scheme is a breath of fresh air. It makes good use of hardwired buttons and knobs for all of the most used and most important features. You don't have to try and master some bizarre mouse device or click through a half dozen menu screens to use the stereo or AC. The 430's buttons and knobs are large, intuitively placed, and plainly labeled, allowing you to achieve your intentions with minimal thought and effort, which is exactly what you want when your primary task is driving. This is a very space-efficient cabin, with more interior room than the competing Mercedes-Benz S-Class despite smaller exterior dimensions. The LS's newfound height did wonders for headroom and legroom, and while the old 400 was already quite roomy up front, the backseat of the 430 is truly cavernous, leaving nothing to be desired in the way of sheer space. This is one of the few sedans out there where backseat space rivals anything, anywhere, large SUVs included. The seat itself is high and supportive, in addition to being of fine material quality. Like in many luxury cars, the rear seat does not fold flat as keeping the seat fixed increases the structural rigidity and overall isolation of the cabin. However, in an improvement over the LS400, a pass-through hole was provided for long, thin items. 
Of course, rear seat occupants are treated to a rear sunshade, a pair of vanity mirrors, a pull-down center armrest with cup holders, and in all but absolute base model cars, seat heaters. And in the case of the top trim LS430, the ultra luxury model, you got a very decadent executive rear seat package including heated, cooled, and massaging power rear seats with memory settings, side window shades, rear climate and stereo controls, and even a small refrigerator. The other primary feature added by that ultra luxury package was the height and firmness adjustable air suspension. Now, the LS430's air suspension may have been more reliable than most, but since such systems are typically prone to more and more expensive problems as they age in comparison to conventional suspensions, many consider it to be a potential headache. And considering that most buyers in the current market aren't buying an LS430 to ride in the rear seat, the trappings of the ultra-luxury model are widely considered to be a collection of whimsical maintenance liabilities. Since the intrinsic goodness of the LS430 is baked into its fundamentals, this car doesn't depend on any particular set of features to make it special. But Lexus did pack this car full of worthwhile options and accessories, and most buyers will probably find a sweet spot in one of the three packages beneath the Ultra Luxury. So here they are. One rung above a base model car was the Premium Package, which came with parking assist and heated rear seats, and added cooling and ventilation to the already heated front seats. Picking up where the premium package leaves off, the popular modern luxury was the middle of the road LS430 and that's exactly what this car right here is. This is a worthwhile package because it was the entry point for the Mark Levinson and Navigation head unit. While you probably don't care about the navigation itself, this head unit is good for several reasons. First, the Mark Levinson 240 watt 11 speaker AM FM CD cassette stereo delivers truly good sound quality for a factory unit. Second, this unit comes with a touchscreen, which modernizes the look of this interior and enables the LS430 to display a rear backup camera feed. Third, this head unit has built-in Bluetooth. As a disclaimer, I will say, I'm not certain whether this version of Bluetooth, or as the owner's manual calls it, the Bluetooth, is forward compatible with newer phones, but it's there, microphone and all. Next up, the Custom Luxury Package slots in directly below the Ultra Luxury and comes with everything the Modern Luxury Package has and, as you might expect, a few more toys. Those would be laser cruise control, power door closers, and headlamp washers. But the Custom Luxury comes with several outright quality upgrades as well that I think make it particularly choice. A suede headliner, upgraded semi-aniline perforated leather, and laminated side glass. The laser cruise control and parking assist mentioned above were quite advanced for their day, and function about as seamlessly as you'd expect in a new car. Joining them among the LS430's electronic driver aids was a pre-collision system optional on custom and ultra luxuries. It really is remarkable just how far from obsolete this car is despite its age. A sport suspension package was offered as an option on all LS430s with the exception of the Ultra Luxury. This package, which is present on this particular car, comes with stiffer spring and shock rates, a thicker rear sway bar by 1mm, and these 18-inch alloy wheels. By the way, it was possible to order the 18s on their own without getting the sport suspension if you wanted. For good measure, among the standard equipment that hasn't already been mentioned are the sunroof, power door closer, dual zone automatic climate control, universal remote garage door opener, automatic rain sensing windshield wipers, anti-lock brakes, traction control, stability control, and more airbags than I care to count. By the way, in 2001 to 2003 cars, traction and stability control are both defeatable, while in 2004 through 2006 models, only traction control is. The LS430's powertrain consists of a 4.3-liter V8 with a 6-speed automatic transmission, driving an open rear gear with a 3.77 ratio. That's a relatively high aggressive number, and it's one of several measures by Lexus to give the 430 more spirited off-the-line acceleration than its predecessors. There's also the sheer displacement increase up to 4.3 liters over the earlier cars 4.0, and the fact that that displacement was added as increased bore while maintaining the same stroke. Fundamentally though, this V8 is similar to the old one, which is good, because when the UZ engine family was introduced with the 1990 LS400's 1UZ, it was so many light years ahead of the competition, well, it wasn't really much of a competition. 
Born out of a nearly $1 billion investment from Toyota, these all-aluminum, dual-overhead cam, 32-valve engines were revolutionary. Nearly as exotic as what you'd find in a Ferrari, yet low-maintenance and reliable. It is timing belt driven, so you'll want to stay on top of that because this is an interference engine. Otherwise, these are some of the most trouble-free engines ever made. And that's pretty amazing considering the amount and quality of power they give you. Specifically, that would be 278 horsepower at 5600 RPM and 312 pound-feet of torque at a modest 3400 RPM. The UZ-V8 is naturally an extremely smooth running design, and the three UZ's internals are ultra lightweight and low friction for increased smoothness, and the crankshaft is fully balanced with eight counterweights as opposed to six like most V8s. This engine came with Toyota's Intelligent Variable Valve Timing, or VVTI, which continuously varied intake valve timing and opening duration and thus intake exhaust valve overlap timing. VVTI actuation is mechanical via oil pressure, and an electronic control component is present as well via an oil control valve whose position is directed by the engine computer based on various operating inputs. VVTI accomplishes two things. It optimizes the engine's power band so that power is as strong as it can be at all RPMs, and it decreases fuel consumption and emissions. VVTI played a big part in the 3UZ's efficiency, and this, combined with the LS430's extremely low coefficient of drag and relatively low weight, less than 2 tons base model, gave the LS430 good fuel economy. Real-world fuel economy of 19 miles per gallon overall on premium fuel was the highest among five flagship luxury sedans tested in a 2003 Consumer Reports comparison. Mid-20s on the highway at 75 miles per hour is routine. By the way, that Consumer Reports test was of an LS430 with the earlier 5-speed automatic. It was upgraded to a 6-speed for 2004, further increasing fuel economy. Keeping in tradition with the Toyota 4 and 5-speed rear-wheel drive transmissions that came before it, this 6-speed is both extremely smooth and extremely durable. Unlike the earlier models, however, it is a sealed design with no dipstick, so it is a little more complicated to check and service. The LS430 comes with Toyota's intuitive powertrain control, essentially a fancy name for a drive-by-wire throttle. Now, I don't love all drive-by-wires. In many cars, I would prefer a mechanical throttle, but this is a good one. It analyzes a number of inputs and coordinates throttle position and gear ratio smoothly and appropriately. Speaking of smooth, Lexus mounted this car's engine with a slight front-to-back tilt so that the prop shaft would line up absolutely straight from the tail shaft of the transmission to the rear axle, with no kinks or angles. This trick, originally employed on the LS400, reduces wear on the drivetrain and reduces vibration. The motor mounts themselves are fluid-filled hydraulic units. Suspension consists of double wishbones along with stabilizer bars and monotube gas struts both front and rear. A double wishbone design is generally considered to be the most expensive and least compromised of all suspension geometries, and you might expect that most of the LS430's competitors would match it in this regard as expensive as they were, but they didn't all, most of them making do with multi-link or even McPherson strut designs. Geometry of this suspension was carefully perfected by the engineers at Lexus to maintain strong composure over a wide range of articulation in order to keep the wheels flat and the car as stable as possible under all circumstances. Overall suspension travel, already long in the LS400, was increased for this car, for yet more road isolation. Additionally, the LS430 featured cast aluminum upper control arms and steering knuckles in order to lower unsprung weight. The LS430 suspension is coupled to an extremely stiff body structure. Here again, we see the heavy use of tools like CAD and Finite Element to model how the car's body responds to forces and identify the optimal structural layout to yield high rigidity without simply adding mass. The benefit of such a stiff chassis is it allows more control of the car's ride to be handed over to the suspension where it belongs. With the responsibility to absorb impacts in the hands of the shocks, springs, and bushings, the LS430's engineers were able to tune these components for high levels of compliance. Weight distribution of 52% over the front axle and 48% over the rear is also quite good. The beauty of the LS430 is that its mechanicals, its powertrain, drivetrain, chassis, and suspension exhibit extreme sophistication and elegance at the fundamental level, and it pays off. To simply crawl an inch down the road in this car is just supreme. The isolation is otherworldly. 
It feels like there's a magical layer of clouds and warm butter and fresh asphalt between you and the pavement. Over the course of my lifetime, I've been up and down my grandparents' gravel driveway over and over in any number of different cars and trucks. The smoothness when you finally hit the asphalt at the other end, or for that matter, the roughness when you first pull off the road onto the driveway, is always striking. But if you dropped me blindfolded into this car as it rolled down this gravel, I'd believe I was on pavement. And that's the real deal. This car's motion, its ride quality, establishes it as more than just another car. The eerie, immaculate smoothness comes forth and wraps itself around you like a two-ton comfort blanket, like a purring tiger bristling up against your body. And the LS430 remains smooth, steady, and stable beyond any speeds it will ever legally see on American highways. After all, like an S-Class or a 7 Series, this car was designed for the Autobahn, and a car that's composed at 120 miles per hour will naturally feel like a brick house at 75. But the LS430 is no boat, especially with the sport suspension package like this car has. Now in many cars, especially larger ones, I find optional sport suspensions gimmicky and unproductive. But the LS430 suspension is so fundamentally capable that this car is able to fully exploit the benefits of a variety of suspension tunes. And this sport suspension is widely regarded to have effects that are both tangible and beneficial on the car's driving. Let me be absolutely clear. This car, with the sport suspension, delivers a very soft ride. Not firm, not soft, not in between, but very soft. A standard LS430 may be softer yet, but I don't feel like any extra firmness from the sport suspension is intrusive. All that being said, this car handles quite well, and this is one of the categories in which the LS430 is light years ahead of the old 400. The LS430's steering is perhaps a little on the light side, but not by much at all, and although it doesn't communicate a lot of road feel, it's very tight and responsive. The LS430 is tuned for moderate understeer, no doubt, but turn-in produces remarkably little body lean for a car of this size and ride quality, and the car tracks easily and securely along its chosen path. Just as Lexus paid lots of attention to the suspension geometry in order to achieve an excellent ride and handling balance, so too was the steering's geometry scrutinized, yielding benefits like excellent stability over rough surfaces and an extremely low turning circle. In fact, this car's turning circle is just 35.8 feet. Not only is that way lower than this car's competitors, it matches a Dodge Neon and a VW New Beetle of the same year. Good steering characteristics couple with this car's relatively tight footprint to give the driver a lot of control in parking and other manners of low-speed maneuvering. As you settle into a turn, you'll find outstanding tire grip from this car. In fact, pushing this car down a twisting road at higher speeds raises an interesting point. It seems that a lot of the big luxury cruisers we've seen over the years were tuned soft because they didn't have the mechanical chops to maintain sporting pretensions. A Cadillac DeVille, Lincoln Town Car, or even Lexus ES for that matter all fall into this category. But the LS430 suspension design bows to no one and the soft character of this car is purely a matter of choice and not expediency. In many big, softly sprung cars, the driver's sense of the body's movements is vague and his level of control is minimal, but this is not true of the LS430. Now, you'd expect a 4.3 liter V8 to give you loads of power, and this one certainly does, but that is not the main attraction here. This engine is dead smooth. The way it runs, its power delivery, it's just not like other engines. It feels like a jet, like an electric motor, as if it's been freed from all of the worldly shackles that bind every other gas piston engine, and all you're left with is pure power, pure continuous thrust on demand. It doesn't stutter, it doesn't vibrate, it hardly makes noise. All it does is push. You may recall that the earlier revision of this engine, the 4 liter from the LS400, was the subject of party tricks put on by Lexus and auto journalists alike, from stacking pyramids of wine glasses on the hood at Redline to balancing coins on the intake manifold at idle. And this engine is no less smooth than its predecessor. The power band is perfect for typical driving, starting off with very strong off-the-line torque and continuing to lay down gobs of smooth power as the tack needle rises. You'll want to keep an eye on that tack needle, by the way, if you want to have any idea of when the car is shifting gears because that's about your only indication that it's happening. 
Most of the time, the tack needle lies low in the RPM range while the understressed V8 hums along silently with loads of excess power waiting in the wings like a crouching tiger waiting to pounce. The feel of this engine is so special that it's a treat to drive even just in normal low-speed cruising. Although Lexus claimed 0-60 to 60 times of just under 6 seconds, most journalists weren't able to replicate this, winding up with real-world times of more like mid-sixes. Brakes are 12.4 and 12.2-inch ventilated discs front and rear with good pedal feel and strong response. The more time you spend behind the wheel of the 430, you come to realize just how many times its engineers and designers must have gone back to the drawing board. This car never makes an uncouth sound or movement. Its transmission is never caught flat-footed. The ergonomics are never close enough. With most cars, the goal is to get from point A to point B, but in this car, that's almost inverted. You might not care if point B ever arrives or not. Driving this car brought back vivid memories of the first time I ever rode in an LS430. It was fall 2007. Now, nobody remembers everything that happened to them 12 years ago, but that Lexus stood out to me. It was a sunny day. The car was silver with a black interior. I sat in a rear seat on the passenger side. I remember the car climbing across a long, sweeping, raised concrete highway ramp at full speed and feeling like we had never left the ground. I fell asleep in the back seat of that car. I never fall asleep in cars. On that day was struck a line of demarcation in my conscience. All of the other cars I had ever experienced in my life up until that point suddenly felt utterly comparable to one another and created anew in my understanding was another class of machine entirely, a class to which only this car belonged. Lexus has claimed something to the effect of having never tried to make the greatest luxury car in the world, but rather to make the best car they could possibly make at the time. In other words, they sweated the details and fundamentals before they ever tried to reinvent the wheel. But in a roundabout way, with this very practical philosophy of accepting the worldly limitations of what a car can be, Lexus was, in fact, making what happened to be the greatest luxury cars in the world. Oh, and hey, that's not my quote. That was the Ford guy. But I'm going to level with you now. I do think that the first few generations of Lexus LS are the best cars ever made. I think that they're the greatest cars ever made. And I know not that many people agree, but that's what I believe. You might think, really? It's just a Toyota. It's just a boring old Toyota. It's just an old, boring, mass-market Toyota sedan. Look, I never said it was the fastest or the coolest or the biggest or the most expensive or the sexiest car, but those are such superficial ways to measure such a complex machine's merit. And if you ever wanted a car whose merit was more than superficial, this is it.